Hi, welcome to the Honeycomb Podcast, the podcast all about New Zealand food and drink and the people that make it happen. I'm Asher Boot, your host and owner of The Ramen Shop, Hillside Kitchen and Cellar in Tinakori Bistro. Taking care of all the technical stuff is producer Steve Cochran of Rockpool Productions. This week we're speaking to Chef Adam Newell of Union Square Bistro and Bar in Martinborough. He talks to us about moving to New Zealand, working as a chef owner and starting an olive grove. Adam, thanks for joining us. No, no problem at all. Yeah. Um, so Good we, to see you guys. Yeah, so we're here at Union Square in, um, in Martinborough, um, which you started up how long ago now? Well, it was early planning stages, I suppose, early uh, 18, and I'm in end of April, May last year. Yeah. So, yeah, it's been a... Bit of a ride, yeah. but no, it's been good. It's been really good. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Most people know you from Zabibo mm. in, in Wellington, which what, 19 years you were saying? Yeah, uh, yeah, 19 years. years. That's that's fantastic. That's such a great run for a restaurant and you're rebranding that. So we can look forward to Pico soon. Yeah, end of the month, early March should be should be opening day. So no, it's exciting. Yeah, something something new coming out of the, out of the space. Fantastic, looking forward to it. Uh, you obviously came over from the UK, we can tell by your accent. Mm, uh, when yeah. did you come to New Zealand? I came over here, I was working in Tokyo and met a Kiwi girl and she dragged me over in 97 and that was it really. I came over, took me on a tour yeah. all around the South Island. We stayed in Queenstown, I think it was the first town we really hit and uh, I just fell in love with the it place. It would have been a very different Queenstown then. It was, yeah, completely. <laughs> I mean, it was, yeah, still beautiful but... Yeah, not as not as commercial, but it was yeah, stunning. Just uh, I knew I wanted to be here, so fantastic. Yeah. All right. So I grew up in the UK. What what drove you to being a chef? I think well, a couple of things. I had a grandmother who was a, my mother's a really terrible cook. Not that you know she's good <laughs> at a lot of things. You know, one thing she can't do is cook, but my grandmother could. And I didn't I didn't grow up sitting on her knee doing beans and none of that sort of stuff. Yeah. But she just cooked really good food. But I had a cousin that was a chef and okay. he had traveled the world. He had gone to Bermuda, he lived in Jersey, Guernsey, France, and really had a good time. And I thought, wow, this is awesome. And yeah. uh, I wasn't the most academic, I guess, out of out of our family. <laughs> uh, but I enjoyed cooking and I thought, wow, I can travel. So I signed up and and from day one, I, I really enjoyed it. So you did um, chef school? You, you yeah. did qualifications? Yeah, did that in Plymouth. Yep. Uh, way back when it was sort of a three-year course. Yeah. Uh, stuck it out. But really, like, from day one, I thought, yeah, I really enjoy this. This is where I want to be. Yeah. And uh, How do you feel about that evolution? It's something that I look at quite a lot in terms of, you know, you had a good three-year training period or apprenticeship periods and things like that compared to we're seeing a lot of graduates coming out sort of a year at, um, at a polytech or, or something mm. like that. I mean... For the industry, um, being work ready, coming out of training, how do you see that with um, sort of chefs compared to when you were coming through to, to today? I, I think f- for me, I think the the, the, the programs are maybe too condensed. Mm. I think the learning for me over the three years was a lot longer and more intense. Yeah, And it also gave us more time to work summer jobs. It gave us more time to work Easter. It gave us more time. The big thing that we're seeing, and I'm sure you are, is people come out and they're just... It's unrealistic. The, yeah. the lifestyle, the workplace is totally different to mas- Master Chef or it is. you know Polytech. Yeah, uh, it is a little bit different. So I think that's got to be fixed somehow. Uh, it does. I, I was thinking about this the other day because I I didn't know I wanted to be a chef. I did the qualifications because it was something that was there to do almost. Mm. It wasn't probably until two three years of working mm. that I really grew a passion. Yeah. So I didn't come in with a preconception of what being a chef is meant to be. I yeah. think that's actually put me in really good stead through my career because um, mm. I've never wanted to be a celebrity chef or anything like that. It's always been mm. about the work and the job and the, the pride and and doing the job well. So yeah, it is a real challenge for, for new chefs coming through, having yeah. an image that they feel like maybe they have to achieve. I, I think I think you're dead right. I think it's just they they just come out thinking that it's all glamorous. There isn't, you know, you go to the bottom <laughs> and you're peeling spots and yeah. And you're peeling onions, and, that, and that's not what you see or you yeah. read about. You're, you're you're trying to do all these little dishes with phones and all this sort of carry on, and it's not like that. You, you know, you got at least five years hard graft yeah. before you get let loose. Oh, absolutely. You know, on a grill, cooking or plating food. Yeah. So, yeah. And and your training was that sort of classical French? Was that the base of it? It was, yeah, yeah, pretty much. There was no when I, I grew up in Cornwall, yeah, and Rick Stein, I think, possibly had just arrived mm. in the early eighties. So it was immediately hotels in London was yep. really it in England. There was nothing. It was it was pretty dire the whole of, the whole of the UK except London and the hotels mm. like Claridge's, Savoy, Connaught. So just made my, made my way there. Knew I had to go 
and get some sort of classical yeah. training in, in French. And I stayed that route the whole time. Yeah. I didn't go the Italian, didn't go fusion. It was it just wasn't around. Because that's probably another thing coming back to training is you look at the curriculum and it's so many cuisines that people are mm. trying to learn a basin and, and, and you can't. No, you, that's you right. know, yeah. Yeah, you, you gotta learn how to cook before you can learn how to do a whole lot of different techniques and, and that's styles right. and cuisines. Yeah. So no that's really really interesting. Uh, you ended up working for the Rue Brothers? Yep. I I worked I worked in a few hotels in London and I really enjoyed it and then decided that there was it was really them at the time. It was sort of mid to late 80s that I started realising these guys were it. So mm. at the end of the 80s, 89, I just sent a letter off and yeah, yeah. got accepted and, and yeah, it was it was the best time really. Yeah. It was sort of people say I was I stayed there about five years and but I really enjoyed it. I don't think I learned anything really. People leave, they just do one year to the day. Yeah. And you really start your learning after year two and yeah. three with these guys and start to really listen to them and become they'll, a they'll speak to you that's it yeah they, become they, a roo robot after a year they just yeah roo robot that's yeah. what a lot of people used to call us yeah that all we would cook was their way but it was really you just got great knowledge really depth mm. of knowledge and then you can go and do your own thing yeah and that's what i try to say to young chefs is just learn one style if you're going to go and learn italian learn italian if you're going to want to go vietnamese go and work in a vietnamese place don't try and do it out of too many books yeah just go go and uh work in these places so I really enjoyed it and uh, yeah stayed with them a long time fantastic mm. yeah I mean that's a I mean that's been a proven ground of so many chefs that mm. must be a, a special club to be part of really to, to come through yeah. the system and I it's one place I wish I had sent off a CV to while I was in London it really mm. is so, um, it, it's definitely, it was definitely tough it was hard yeah but the ingredients they were using the the, the demand was mm. was just so high and it was so competitive with just all the other chefs yeah and I think that's the difference where in New Zealand it's very and it's great that everyone's mates and everyone's friendly but when you're over in those type of restaurants everyone's after you and it's not just the chef is yeah the it, chef the party's down they all want to see you fail I guess yeah I mean and it I, just drives you that that Michelin environment I, I was working at the Dorchester and I remember the, the glass office in the middle of the, the mm. four different kitchens with this pile of CVs mm. that you'd be you'd be shown when you when you first started here's a pile of CVs of people that want your job mm. you know yeah and, and that was the competitiveness of it you, you couldn't you couldn't drop you couldn't no. not be there you couldn't be on form it just wasn't an option yeah yeah so a different environment I mean you know kitchens are changing environments are changing yeah in, in general and even um, in some of those kitchens, the whole whole way people are working, we've seen the evolution of the, either the four day working week and, and three days off, or, mm. or things like that, which I think yeah. is probably a positive thing, so we don't get quite so much burnout. Oh, um, I think so. I think it's a, it's a big problem in this industry. I think mm. the pay rates have got to go up, but people oh, have got to, you know, what we do as a as a team in in kitchens in New Zealand around the world is, you know, you're producing food to such a high standard, and people deserve to be paid more money and but the public have got to understand you're just gonna to have to pay a little bit more for it yes yeah, they right. do it with plumbers they let you know plumbers are paid 45 an hour the apprentice you know the apprentices are paid 25 30 it's you know it's just the way it's got to be and it's got to be that way you can give people yeah three days off until that happens you know it's almost like we've got to collectively get together and just go hey this is the new you know i'd like to see a 20 dollar working Absolutely. living wage yeah you know we don't pay anyone here under 20. yeah we just, that's just the way we work. And, and it attracts good kitchen hands and they'll stay. But how do you live? $20 is. Yeah. It's tough. It you is. Know, the it is hard. absolutely tough. Anti social. That's, that's it. It's something we've been talking about a few times now on the, on the podcast about what the value of restaurants. Mm. And that's where I said, I think, you know, we're probably 25% off in terms of what we charge, in terms of what it should be for people to earn, you know, yeah. full levels, comparable industries and trades and, and things like that. Yeah. And it is the value of a restaurant as opposed to just the food on a plate. Yeah. You know, it's not, you're not just paying for the ingredients. No. You're paying for the whole experience. Yeah. For me, one of the big things is seeing the evolution of delivery companies. And people are willing to pay a premium to not get the restaurant experience, you know, to be lazy and sit at home and not get yeah, any of that yeah, sort of environment. Yeah. Whereas when you go to a place and get looked after, that, that should be the premium. That should be the... The yeah. special time sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a fascinating problem, but um, I think there are shifts happening. The industry's mm. moving forward, so as long as that keeps going, and yeah, there, there's got to be a way forward somehow. Yeah, and I think it's generally you know it's the money side of it is the way that it yeah. that it works, and and trying to get those hours down. Absolutely, you know, trying you know once after ten hours, no one wants to be there. <laughs> no. You you need that early early and late shift. Yeah, uh, you know, going on maybe the older guys. 
like me, you know, you'll do the doubles <laughs> or whatever. But the young people yeah. coming in, just go easy. We've got a guy, he's 19 and he's a great kid. Mm. And he's he came day one and he's, he's special needs, yeah. but he's just started an apprenticeship about two weeks ago. And that's just the way that we think. We can yeah. do it with one person and we're just determined to make this guy into somebody yeah. and, and really great. give him a start in life. And and that's the way that you can do it and just doing eight hour days, not At, not thrashing anybody. Absolutely. And that comes yeah. down to your business plan, I guess, as well. I know with Hillside, we went to tasting menu only and the reason we did that is we knew we could get everyone down to a 40 hour working week Yeah. Uh, by focusing on yeah. not trying to offer too much. Yep. Um, it's hard, it's challenging. We've still got to try and communicate that that's what we're about and that's why we're doing it. But mm. yeah, it, it is a real a real challenge um, for the industry. We've got a bit forward here. Um, let's go back. You came to Wellington, you set up in Wellington. Did you work for someone else first in Wellington? I did. I came here. I, I met Chris Green and All right. John Lawrence and Mike Egan one day at Bullcock Street. Mm. Someone said, someone said, look, I'll go and see these guys. And they, they've got places, you know, you, you might get a job. Yeah. So I just came here and what Nicholas said to me, oh, why don't you come over here? So I did arrive with no visa, nothing. Yeah. It was just like, oh, I'll have a wander around. And I thought, well, there's not that many jobs here. And then I went up to see them and they said, oh, there's a job over the hill at the Marlborough Hotel, if you like. Yeah. And I said, oh, okay. So I went over there, met Gavin Redmond, uh, the guys here. And then they were operating, going to operate to Papa. Mm. So they said, oh, we'd really like you to come back. So I only stayed here five months okay. while it was being built in 98. Yep. And went back. And I think it was, if I'd stayed here longer, I think, I probably wouldn't have come back this time. Yeah. And, you know, took over. Yeah. But yeah, I, I stayed <laughs> at Tabapa a couple of years at Icon. Okay. And then went up to Auckland for the first America's Cup with the mm. guys who owned Chin Chin. So yep. I don't you remember that. Yeah, yeah. We got okay. Wildfire, which was completely not me. <laughs> uh, it was this huge monster of a place. Yeah. You know, sort of seven, eight hundred people a day. Yeah. It was just huge. But I knew I wanted to be back in Wellington. So yeah. went down looking for buildings and spaces, found the old police station, and that was it, really. Fantastic. Yeah, did a pretty substantial fit out, and uh, 19 years later. Very good. Over the hill, yeah. Yeah, yeah, back to Union Square. How's it been coming? I mean, obviously you're in here for five months, so probably romantic images of the place. Yeah. Uh, but actually, yeah, getting stuck back in and being owning it and being you know yeah it's it's sometimes i walk around and you sort of pinch yourself you go oh god you you know <laughs> like you remember this the parts of it and it's you yeah. know you're back and it's yours and it, it's but there's the same the winemakers are still here mm. the clive patterns the roger parkins all these guys and they've done a massive job for marnborough i think yeah. just the way marnborough has grown that whole you know romantic let's go away for the weekend do yeah. some wineries and yeah, we just feel really welcomed, really embraced by the community. Fantastic. Can, yeah, I think any any business that is quite strong, they're really happy. Yeah, you know, for you to be, yeah, to be involved. So yeah, it is. Great. I mean, you're an established name. People know who you are, so you're really bringing something to the community mm. as well. You can really add to it. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. The locals really appreciate that. And being close to food is, I think we've always, while we're in Wellington, trying to get that wire wrapper thing going, trying to. You know, whether it's vegetables, fish, herbs, yeah. whatever. We've been trying to do that for a long time. But being here is just every day you just you're yeah. open to people walking in the door with different produce. That's fantastic. Which does happen in the in Wellington, but not as much. Yeah. You're seeing this on a daily basis, which is sort of ins inspirational a little bit. Oh, I can imagine. Yeah. You know, it's people with oils, people with Nalini, the... Someone pressing new oil, someone doing something, and it's like, oh, go and try it out. You know, take them in yeah. there. Go and see Adam, he'll give it a go. And we generally do. Fantastic. And it's, yeah, it's a, a really nice, nice thing to be involved in. Nice for those guys too. Yeah. That they're not seeing herbs coming from Bidvest or <laughs> yep. they're, they're seeing the yep. real deal. And, you know, whether it's just one herb that actually tastes like a herb. And, you know, yeah. So. And so from a restaurant point of view, being in, I guess, a smaller town it um, depends on tourism to a to a large extent mm. how is that is it you know do you get a lot of weekend trade from over the hill or is it is it more consistent or how's it feel uh, yeah weekends are busy yeah we did one winter and i think it was our honeymoon and it was we thought it was relatively relatively busy yeah. you know the weekends do get there's a lot of airbnb in this town yeah, a lot of people coming over a lot of groups come over a lot of weddings so we don't see a lot of weddings here we haven't done any uh, it's a little bit too small, yeah. but we do see a lot of wedding parties before and after. Mm. So, you know, it, it is a beautiful old building on the square. So oh, it's if you come to Martinborough, they sort of do congregate here a little bit yeah. uh, for drinks and nibbles and things like that. Yeah. So, no, it's been great. Fantastic. Yeah. 
Okay, and, and you've really set up in the wire wrapper, or you've got your olive grove going. Mm. How's that? That's good. Yeah, yeah. That was when we moved over here. That was the thing that we got a bit of land down by the Rua Mahanga, about 25 acres. So we thought we put in 3,000 olive trees. <laughs> and this is just as we were sort of making that transition from Zavivo to here. Yeah. And I think it was good good for the soul, just to every day just going banging in posts, digging yeah. holes, planting trees. It was just getting away yeah. from, you know, a lot of people said, oh, you know, you've retired, you're doing this. It was just a break. Yes. And I think like, I always say to the guys in here, like these cooking games are, it's a long race. Yeah. It's it, nothing wrong with having 18 months off. No. Just to clear your mind and work out really where you want to be and what you want to do. And I think it was the best time. I think it was, yeah, it was mm. just, if I carried on, I think I would have just gone, yeah. you know, I'm over this, I'm out. But to have that time out. Yeah, I think there's perfect. a lot of correlation between being a chef and being a farmer it, mm. it, you know it's there's a lot of immediate things that we always need dealing with but it is a long-term planning yeah thing i mean farming's longer mm. uh, but in a kitchen you're always thinking ahead and trying to be organized and you know your, your mees has to be in the right place for things to work and farming's pretty much yeah. the same yeah. if you don't set up right yeah you kind of bug it down the track so <laughs> you do. yeah, yeah, yeah. It, there are a lot of similarities there yeah, yeah. Ah, really fascinating yeah. Uh, so no, it was it was it was great, and we you know we now grow pigs, and we've I put in a huge veggie, did it properly, you know lots of it was an old vineyard, and I recycled a lot of the posts and set up a vegetable garden and uh, fruit, and yep. uh, so we use a lot for here. We were using a lot for zavivos, but we will use a lot for pico, and yeah. you know whether it's just basil, oregano, whatever we can grow, we'll try and grow, yeah. uh, and it just makes a massive difference, not just. Price wise, because you've got to make money, but it tastes out of this. Oh, world. it does. Yeah, it's completely the, different. The difference is incredible. Yeah. Um, the shelf, the extended shelf life yeah. of commercial vegetables is deteriorates flavour incredibly, and you don't realise it mm. until you've got immediate access to a lot of those fresh yeah. vegetables and the difference yeah. that it makes. No, that that is a massive thing. Yeah. Also, I mean olives as well. Really yeah. passionate about yeah. oil. Always have been. I, mean, I remember when. I was in, it was in the 80s and there was, wasn't really any good olive oil, eh? And I remember going to Claridge's and there was this guy called John Williams who was one of the sous chefs and he introduced us to this olive oil, it was called Valley de Beau, I'll never forget it. It was a gold label and it was out of France somewhere. And I thought, holy shit, this tastes completely different to the diesel, you know, like yeah. the big industrial stuff. Yeah. And all he did was some tomato concasse basil and threw it together with a bit of I can't remember what it was, and a little bit of vinegar or something, mm. and it tasted like whoa. Now this is different, and yeah. I think you know I, all that the Ree brothers always had the same stuff, other brands, and it was always expensive. Yeah, and so I kind of got the bug then that and using a lot of olive oil, I've moved away a lot from not because we own an olive grove, but <laughs> other, just a healthier option of yep. doing drizzles and oils, and uh, so the passion's there to produce good oil. Good olive so oil. yeah, good olive oil and. Brined olives, yep. you know, this country doesn't, we produce really good oil, but the market for brined olives, you know, 99% of it comes out of Greece or yeah, yeah. Kalamatas that they don't want, that have <laughs> been cured. I don't know, a lot of people don't know this, but to speed up the process of curing olives, they use caustic soda. Okay. And you, you can get, you know, when you get olives and they're so bitter mm. and they really blow your mind, you put a certain amount of caustic soda in cold water overnight, that olive doesn't have any bitterness the next day. Yeah. But the water's black, but the olive's completely rinsed out. Yep. It's got no flavor whatsoever. And then they send it off to little old New Zealand yeah. with a little bit of, you know, brine and vinegar going on. So that's, there's another guy, Jeff from uh, Telegraph Hill. Mm -hmm. He's probably got the, uh, he's got the up on me at the moment, <laughs> yeah. but that's my next thing is to start really uh, producing yeah. Good brined olives. Fantastic. Because, you know, New Zealand's, it used to be when I got here, no one would eat an anchovy, no one would eat an yeah, olive. Yeah, no, there's a big difference. It's changed. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So. I mean, we get amazing olives. Shout out to Two Short Dogs, um, growing yep. down in, in um, Marlborough. Yeah, the brined olives from, from them, we, we use a lot of, and they are fantastic. The difference between yeah. pretty much anything else we can get is huge. Um, so, Marlborough being an agricultural region, you're dealing mm. with one of the issues of that at the moment, the, um, having to boil water. Yeah. How's that for a restaurant? Yeah, it's been hard, especially with Fair Day. That was probably the hardest. Yeah. And I think the not knowing, I think, was the hardest part. Mm -hmm. You know, nothing, I think it all came on too fast for the council to 
sort of deal with it. But uh, I think it was compounded with a fear last last week where they were, you know, there's that little weighing up of, we were making comments about, I don't know if you've seen the movie Jaws, where you don't want to <laughs> announce that there's a shark in the water yeah. because there's a whole lot of tourists coming into town. Yep. So, and it was Thursday night when we got told, you know, yeah. your coffee machines, this, that, and there was one bit of paper, then someone else would have another idea and now you can't do this. But yeah, it's been hard, you know, changing all your your systems over in your kitchen, everything's got to be boiled, the water. Uh, thank God the machines, your wash, your dishwashers are okay. Yeah. But uh, coffee machines can be. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, so it's, yeah, it was a it was a real pain in the ass, <laughs> you know, for 24 hours. Yeah. Trying to get it sorted out. Wow. So, yeah. No, that's... Whoever was selling water on Saturday, I said, would do, they did very well. Yes. Yeah. Bottled water. Yeah. That's another big story going on at the moment as well. Yeah. All right. Um, so we're seasonal-wise, we're coming to... We're not quite at the end of summer, but coming into to autumn. Um, what what are you looking at um, based in this region? What's what's the menu direction going to be coming into autumn here? Well, I think I think a lot of lot of this town's famous for walnuts, a yep. lot of walnuts. So pickles, pate, that sort of autumn hunkering down, sort of preserving thing. Yep. You know, we'll get a lot of stone fruit now. We'll start to talk to the suppliers that we want to start bottling, yep. and obviously truffles. We've got a truffle lady up in Opaki. They'll start to come ripen. She'll give me sort of updates as to what's going on, how many she's got. And then, you know, later on, it'll be June, July, I guess, we'll get the phone call and she'll, yep, come yeah. down and it'll all be. Is there much mushroom foraging around? Do you give me any bullets? And... There are a little bit, but I haven't seen too much over here yet. We've yeah. got Dan, who's from Masterton. He's got a friend who's starting to grow oyster mushrooms. Yep. And he brings them in from now time to time, a little bit hit and miss. Yep. But uh, yeah, we're starting to see a little bit more. Mm. But I think, you know, you do the, the foraging thing in Wellington, you know, people are growing stuff here. That's Yeah, that's true. Very true. They're, they've actually got a little bit of land and they're yep. growing this stuff. So it's not like you're wandering the hedgerows trying to find <laughs> stuff. It's actually, it's they there. walk in and go, oh, there's all this borage. Do you want it? <laughs> do you want this? And they just, they just come in with big bunches of rosemary, yeah. buckets buckets and buckets of lemons yeah what do you want to do with it oh uh, you know how much do you want for it oh nothing just give me a bottle of wine or yeah i'll have a drink in the bar or you know it's just in the fridge is just sometimes just chocker out there especially fijoas oh. tamarillos things like this it's yep. just it just keeps coming fantastic yeah which is which is nice Great. so we're thinking those autumn sort of flavors you know yeah. thinking about i don't know if you saw there jesse had those long ribs the big short ribs yep. but we haven't cut them uh, I'm going to braise them whole. So those things we're starting to play around with now. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. 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 All right, so just in general, I guess, for you as a chef that's um, been based in, in some amazing restaurants in the UK and then coming to New Zealand, the New Zealand food scene um, mm. in the time that you've been here, that development, how has it evolved? How has it changed and where do you see it going? Well, I, You know what? I When I first arrived here, I thought – some people said to me when I took over Icon, they said, oh, you won't, I wrote the menus and they said, oh, you're not going to find these ingredients, celeriac and all these exotic stuff. And there was, there was people in the wire wrapper doing endive and chicory and you just have to get off your ass and go find it. But what I do, I really hope that this foams, this, you know, this, <laughs> it's almost gone for, you know, I, I really enjoyed the relaxedness of chefs in this country. Yep. When I first arrived, you could give them a recipe and it's so new they're, they're all brand new and you can give it to them and they'll, they'll make that recipe. Whereas in England, it was a little bit different. You, you, you give it to some chef that got a bit of experience, oh fuck, I wouldn't make it that way. Yeah, I've seen it made another way. Whereas Kiwis are generally not like that and I really wouldn't want to see this Michelin guide thing really sort of take hold of the industry here and try to make everything too shishi, too fine dining too, because it's, yep. it's, to be honest, it's, it's dying. It's it, it is. And there is a place for it, yeah. but I think New Zealand food is really relaxed. I think there's no up yourself type guides. Yeah. To there's a cuisine guide, which is great. But if another guy came, there'd be a lot of chefs who go, "Shit, I want a star." Yeah. And they start cooking for those stars. At the moment, we all cook for our customers because we got to make money, and that's not a bad thing. 
And I think the, the, the pure quality of ingredients that we've got here oh. actually fits quite classical cooking really well because mm. that's what most classical cookery is peasant cookery, cookery that's been evolved over yeah. time. And it's all about showing off ingredients as the thing. It's not about so much showing off a technique. You use the technique to get the, yeah, the end product. That's right. We did a prefix menu on Tuesday at the bistro and I was doing profiteroles and grilled sardines and things like that. Yeah, yeah. And the customers love it. Yeah. You know, it doesn't have to be complicated. No. Um, and I, th I think Wellington's like that. I always thought Wellington was more sort of European focused. Mm. I think, it, you know, whether that's government, people are a bit old, I don't know. But the Martinborough definitely is, yeah. when we when we heard of the space was available and we, we just never thought, well, we're gonna do fusion, we're gonna do whatever. It was just, nah, we're doing a bistro. And you walk in and you can do, like you say, profiteroles or a cassoulet. Yeah. People around here know it. Yeah. They've been somewhere overseas and had it, so why? We're just giving them what they want. Yeah. All right, to a finer standard, but we're not trying to be too clever. And yeah. I think that's what New Zealand food, it's all there, the ingredients are there. I think it's just the improvements have been, I think it's phenomenal what's happened. Yeah. You know, Australia had it for so long over New Zealand, but I think the ingredients, the beef, the lamb, the fish, the vegetables, the fruit. Yeah. I've just come out of the bay and the fruit up there is just- That's incredible, isn't it? Incredible. Yeah. You know, we went up to some outer peak with the girls and, and we're looking down and going, oh, there's, you know, Craggy Range over mm -hmm. here and all this. And it's just like a big garden of just fruit, grapes. Yeah. You know, just, just absolutely perfect. So why can't you cook good yeah. food? But it's changed. It would have been 20 years ago, you'd probably take that peach and puree it up and turn it into a mousse and add all these other flavors. Now you'd probably just cut it in half and grill it. Yep. And serve it with some beautiful sort of cheese place down the road. Uh, the drunken nanny, do something with that, and that's yeah. it. Let it sing instead of fantastic. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely great. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Really do appreciate it. Um, no, good to see you guys. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah, very good. Thank you. Thanks for taking the time to listen to us today. Check out honeycomb.co.nz for information and links relating to this episode. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast so you'll never miss an episode. 